Um, so I'll be talking about uh, some work I've been doing using uh, setting up Pangeo on Cedar on, on Jasmine. Um, and for those who don't know, Pangeo is sort of a uh, a cloud net, a cloud um, computing platform uh, specifically developed for working with large Earth observation type data sets. And this is work. Uh, this this software uh, has largely been has been developed by a consortium, but is largely been championed by Ryan Abernathy. And so, if you've seen any of his talks about this, you might recognise a few of the slides. Uh, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, okay. Um, so just, you know, very quick motivation that data that we work with in the earth sciences, so I'm a physical oceanographer, uh, are getting much, much larger, and in some cases exponentially so. Um, so on the left here you see a, um, a figure which is basically shows data holdings from, uh, from satellite observations uh, in one of the uh, NASA archives, and you can see that you know, it was, uh, the year-on-year -year growth was around about two petabytes in the last five or so years, but that's been steadily increasing. And as new satellites come on uh, come online, um, such as the anticipated SWAT and NISA, um, you know, the, the volume of the data that's being produced by these is just going to grow exponentially, or at least uh, <laughs> linearly at much greater rates than we had previously looked at. Uh, and similarly, when we work with large uh, model ensembles, such as the uh, the model ensemble for Earth system climate models, um, so this is like the CMIP archive, um, each generation of CMIP grows uh, dramatically over the last one, both because uh, more variables and more models have been added, as well as more scenarios, um, but also the resolution of the models tends to go up year on year. And so in the CMIP 5, which happened about, so which came out around ooh, eight years ago now, um, that was pushing two petabytes all up uh, for all of its models. Uh, so CMIP6, which is currently being released or was released last year and is being added to, um, that's over 90 petabytes. And you know, if CMIP7, 8, 9 happen, we expect that this will go on increasing in this you know, dramatic fashion. So when it comes to working with these sorts of data sets, traditionally you would just grab the files you need either by downloading them or you know, otherwise getting them physically onto your own personal machine and working on a local disk, either something you SSH into um, or your own laptop on your, on your desktop. But we find that this works just fine for relatively small data sets of up to a gigabyte or so. But once you start pushing terabytes and petabytes, which is what we're looking at for some of these climate ensembles, it really becomes impractical to physically move the data uh, onto your local machine or even can often be very difficult to work with it in remote machines. So Jasmine is wonderful in the sense that they do maintain these large um, archives of model data like CMIP. Um, but there are other ways of working with it. Uh, and so this is, this is the idea of taking your work uh, into the cloud. And instead of working on your own local machine, you work on remote uh, resources and often distributed resources. So on the left here, you see conceptually what the, the idea is. You'll be working with objects. Uh, so this is effectively where your data is being stored. Uh, and I'll get onto what object stores are in a little bit. Uh, and also in the cloud, possibly physically in the same area, um, you'll be working with compute. Uh, and so this is uh, virtual mach well, machines that have been virtually generated in the cloud uh, that you have access to via your web browser. And your all your compute is being done uh, re physically relatively close to the data that you're working with um, on a scalable machine. And the nice thing about Pangea, it allows you to do this work interactively. So often when working with these very large data sets in the past, you'd have to do it in the batch compute sense where you'd write scripts and you'd send it off to an HPC and, and uh, everything would be done um, off, well, effect, away from, um, away from your, your, your interactive investigation, which is not always the way we work best in earth sciences. Often we want to explore the data sets, look for patterns and look for signals or just, just visually look at the data before you decide what you want to do with it. And that can be very, very time consuming when you're dealing with these extremely large data sets, because often a lot of pre-processing needs to be done before you get a figure that, you, that is useful. Um, Pangeo allows you to work with these huge data sets in a manner that's quite similar to you know, working interactively on MATLAB or Python uh, in, a, in, a, um, um, in a way that is much more familiar with smaller data sets. So Pangeo isn't a single piece of software. It's really a sort of an ecosystem that, that Pangeo um, enables and so it's based on Python um, and you know as you can see here radiating further away from the core are the various different uh, utilities and, and bits of software that uh, add um, you know either very fundamental uh, functionality uh, to Python so X-Ray and Dask are some, uh, two 
um, bits of software that I'll get onto, but also, you know, you can start integrating much more specialized bits of uh, software such as Cartapi or uh, XGCM or TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn if you're, you know, depending on exactly what you want to be doing uh, with the data that you're examining uh, using the Pangeo infrastructure. Mm. So the architecture, you know, what you're actually, you know, what is fact functionally happening when you start using Pangeo to examine some data, you have some analysis ready data over here, which is sitting somewhere globally available via the web in distributed storage. Then either in the cloud using sort of cloud compute like, uh, like Amazon Web Service, for example, or Google Cloud, uh, or a suitably set up HPC, which is effectively what we've got going on at Jasmine now. You use the, the tools, so the sort of the back end, Dask and X-Array, effectively allow you to um, work with your, your sort of gridded data sets uh, in a parallelized way. Parallelized way. Um, and distribute the computations you're doing across uh, many more machines than you'd be uh, than you'd typically be able to do, and this is all interfaced uh, via you know Jupyter web browser. So you know your end user, you're just working on a laptop. I've actually even managed to make this work on my phone, though I wouldn't suggest that's a very good way of doing things. Um, <clears throat> so some of the key components that make this work um, and that are you know very fundamental to using Pangea are X-Array. So when working with Earth system data, typically you're working with large multi-dimensional gridded data sets. Um, and X-Array is a really nice um, way of working with these. Uh, it sort of works in the sort of the native coordinates that you uh, would think about rather than working with a dimension one, dimension two, dimension three, you know, your dimensions are given actual names uh, like latitude and longitude. Um, you can let, reference these uh, dimensions directly by their names. It has lots and lots of nice, uh, powerful tools that allow you to do operations over your dimensions. Um, by, you know, for example, here, X array sum, and you just say, I want to do this by time. You don't need to know what dimension that is. You just say time, and off it goes. Um, <clears throat> also, your vector, uh, the operations uh, are vectorized based on the dimension name. You don't actually need to know the shape of your arrays. You just, so that means array broadcasting. So, no more trying to match up two different. Um, uh, two different data sets of different dimensions. Uh, so you don't have to sort of you know, replicate your dimensions over and over again to make them uh, to perform operations on, which is extremely nice. Um, and it has lots of intuitive combinations and operations. So for example, you just, if you have a, um, an array, which has got a time in months or days, but you want to look at this in years, you can just simply say, you know, time.year and it will convert all your time um, from you know, hours, minutes, seconds, or whatever it's in, into years, and then you can, you know, perform operations over your means. So, you know, it's a very nice tool. And it's also specifically designed to integrate with, um, with Dask, which is what I'll get onto here. This is really the, the back end that makes um, parallel, parallelized computation using Pangeo possible. And two of the main features that uh, facilitate this are data chunking and lazy loading. So data chunking is, is basically splitting up your very, very large array. So here's an example here. You have a 32 gigabyte array uh, with some very um, you know, large dimension, uh, but it's split up into much more smaller, more manageable chunks. Um, in this case, you know, instead of being 32 gig, uh, each individual chunk, uh, and there's 256 of them, is only 128 meg. Um, and so when you come to perform computations, the chunks are then distributed across the available processes. Um, allowing you to you know, effectively parallelize these uh, these operations. And this is done automatically. Um, and in large cases, it's, it's more or less invisible in the background. When you're using an X-ray in Pangeo, it will be chunked uh, and Dask will be working on it. Uh, well, Dask will sort of effectively be implemented. Um, there is occasions when you might want to get a bit more uh, manual with this. Um, say, for example, if the chunking is in um, uh, you want to make sure that chunking is in time when, if you're doing analysis in space to make sure you don't need to join too many chunks together to perform the operations you're asking. Uh, but in general, it sort of happens in the background. Uh, and lazy loading is very nice when you're working interactively um, because it actually delays any actual memory usage until specifically called. Really, all you're doing until you specifically ask for data to be loaded into your machines is working with the metadata. Um, and so it allows you to actually sort of manipulate your uh, your data, you know, to quite a high level uh, before you actually say, I, you know, I want to see a figure now, press go and do all the computations. Um, and so I'll, I'll show an example of how that, oops, how that works. Um, but, you know, what Dask basically does is 
it takes your data array and um, calculate, so it takes all the various operations that you've lazily executed. You say, you know, I, I want to take the mean, I want to then slice everything into the, you know, this physical coordinates, I want to take this time slice, uh, and then I want to take the average across uh, that entire space, and I just want one number for example, that will be uh, uh, calculated into a graph. And then that graph will be, then be spread, uh, sent or scheduled across a distributed array. Uh, if you're on a single machine, it might spread it across your processes or the threads available. Uh, and if you're on a distributed machine, I have many um, cores available to you, it will work out how best to distribute that. And that's effectively what's happening in this graph. Um, although whoever animated it did it backwards. Um, but you can see that you know, tasks are basically be gradually being executed in this very parallelized way, eventually coming towards the final answer, which actually should be down here. Uh, but that's conceptually what Dask does, and it's not something you have to worry about until you, you know, really starts getting down to the nuts and bolts of things, but it's effectively the back end that makes all this possible. Um, and then there's object storage. Um, so when we work with Earth system data, typically we're, we're very familiar with the net CDF uh, format. X, uh, so object stores, and in this case, ZAR is an instance of an object store, um, it's basically the same sort of thing. It's working, it, it, it works in a similar way to NetCDF, but it's specifically optimized for cloud uh, computing uh, and it's stored as effectively chunks. So it, uh, the object store, sorry, the object that is being stored is effectively stored as a bunch of chunks. Um, the metadata is kept separate from the data and so that's easily read. And because the array is effectively chunked, you can retrieve bits and pieces of the data rather than having to do everything. Uh, if you just want to look at you know, one time slice, you don't then have to go and get, get an entire model with 100 years. You can just ask for the chunk that has that particular time slice in it. Um, and it's also, um, it, it's also quite nice for distributed storage. Not all the chunks need to be stored physically together. Um, and I understand, and so this is not something I'm anywhere near expert on, um, that NetCDF are actually looking at as they develop and update NetCDF to move into this space. And so you'll have um, uh, object store type um, uh, functionality with NetCDF. Um, so when we're working with Earth system data, we, well, at least me, I'm working with CMEP6. Um, and a lot of this object store data is available. So there's a, a Pangeo catalog that makes CMIP6 data easily available. And all you need is this link. Um, so catalog.pangeo.io, and it will just give you a link at, which will basically give you access to pretty much the entire CMIP6 array, uh, but also things like uh, ECHO. So that's the um, ocean uh, state estimate, SOSI, uh, lots of altimetry data and observational data, and much more. Uh, and, and, all, and more can be requested using a simple form. Um, so nicely, Jasmine is currently looking at setting, moving some of its archive data. Um, so uh, Jasmine stores a lot of CMIP6 data as archive, um, which can't, can't currently be accessed um, using their uh, cloud compute facilities just to the, due to the architecture. But they are looking at setting up an object store, which will start moving some of that into this uh, more accessible format for Pangeo. Uh, and I'll skip over that. This is, Needless to say, there's a whole heap of tools, utility tools that are built uh, on top of this ecosystem just to make your life easier when working with um, specific, um, you know, multi-model um, high resolution data sets. So in, in practice, um, so the, de the, the Pangeo deployment, um, so the only one really that's available in the UK at the moment, unless you feel like setting your own one up on something like Amazon Web Service or your, your local HPC, um, is the Jasmine cluster as a service um, Pangeo deployments. So you can effectively request one of these. Um, so the, I'm working with uh, Matt Pryor and Phil Kershaw who, at uh, STFC, who have been wonderful in really uh, helping us get started with this. I'm no, nowhere near an expert on the back end or architecture of this work, I'm, I'm a scientist. Um, but they've been extremely helpful in getting us set up uh, on in you know, the, the Jasmine cloud. And so just so you have a, a feeling for what this actually is, the, the Jasmine services we typically use are over here inside the firewall in the managed, managed infrastructure. So that's where Lotus, the batch compute system, uh, and the group workspaces sit along with a lot of the data archives. Out here in the Jasmine unmanaged cloud outside the firewall is where um, the various clusters of service um, services are provided, one of which is uh, Pangeo tenancies. Um, so I've requested one of those and had it set up. Um, it's entirely run by myself, although I do get a huge amount of support from Matt Pryor and actually making it work. Um, but so that you don't, don't require a Jasmine account and you become the administrator so you can allow anyone else who wants to come in 
uh, even without any Jasmine accounts um, onto your space. You take care of it largely yourself. Um, user space is provided, but it's not backed up, so users beware. Um, and some of the downsides to this, um, you know, that makes it very flexible and nice to use, but there is a downside in the sense that um, it's not trivial, or it's actually quite tricky, to access some of the user workspaces, and you usually only have one-way access, read access. Um, and so we're looking, hopefully, at some of this data being stored in the archive, being moved into a um, into object stores, which will then be accessible through the Jasmine tenancies. So uh, I can give you a quick demo, hopefully, uh, and see how this actually. Oops. So can you see this screen, uh, Poppy? Could you? <laughs> Just quickly say if you can see the my, my internet's just said it's unstable so i can't see it at the moment but someone else might be able to <laughs> uh the one i can see says panjo live demo fingers crossed okay no so yeah let's... that's what i can see All right, let's try a restart be fun there we go okay now i can see it that looks better yeah yeah right so let's hope this actually works so this is what you see when you log into Pangeo. it's just a jupiter lab notebook um and effectively, you know, you work with it just like you would any other, you know, Jupyter notebook, except for this sort of uh, this bit here where you set up a cluster. So this is a this um, this piece of code is basically saying create a cluster um, out of the resources that have been allocated to us. So in our case, we have something like 100 gigabyte worth of memory and a, you know, a bunch of workers available um, and then <clears throat> effectively interface uh, interface that cluster with this notebook and so this notebook can now see uh, all those workers and when i when i basically if, um, ask for any you know anything to be processed that work is then distributed by dask across those workers um, here um, i can i'm basically loading in the data so this url was the one i referred to earlier it takes you straight to the cmip6 archive um, located somewhere in the web physically i have no idea where it is somewhere in the us i expect um, and then you know, you can, you can query it. Uh, there's lots of ways of searching this. It's quite nice. It's a very quick way of doing things. Um, but I say, I want the UK ESM and I want a bunch of variables. I want this particular ID, um, you know, go away and find it for me. And so when I run that, um, which I already have actually, um, you know, it then sort of basically brings back and all, it's not bringing back the data, it's just bringing back effectively a pointer um, with a bunch of metadata. So it's telling me it's got three variables, there's five um, particular instances of this model, so five runs with slightly different physics or slightly different initial conditions, um, and there's only one ID. And you can do this with a whole bunch of models all at the same time uh, for, for ease of use, I'm only um, talking about one at the moment. Um, and then you physically load, you're still not loading the data, but you're basically loading the, um, the dictionary, which is a bunch of pointers, into um, X-Array. And so this, you know, that takes a minute or so, really, it's, it's quite quick. Um, and it also allows you, um, you can do some pre-processing if you want at this point, which is um, the CMIP archive is frustrating in the sense that all the models are identical except where they're not. Usually when you do with a whole bunch of different models, there's a lot of if else statements to try and get them all to line up. Um, Pandu has some nice software that allows you to deal with a lot of that metadata. So things like getting your longitudes all in the same format, it'll you know, do that more or less in the background. And so what we see here, we, we have a, we have a, a nice sort of X-ray, which has just got the dimensions of our model so it's got five members, it's got a thousand time steps, it's got um, X and Y of you know, these, these coordinates. And down here, we can see the data variables. Again, this is all just sort of metadata. It's, um, you can, so this is uh, dissolved inorganic carbon. Uh, it's telling us it's a, one a 183 gigabyte uh, data set. You can split it up into a thousand different chunks. Uh, and if you want to, this count here, it tells you how many tasks need to be computed just to get that one chunk if you wanted to look at it, for example. And then we can do, uh, you know, a bunch of X-Array, I'm um, sorry, the Pangeo um, um, environment has a bunch of nice tools for working with this. So this is dealing with some of the gridding issues to calculate things like areas and cell faces. Um, and then you can just add that straight into your uh, X-Array. And then we can slice our region. And so this, this is saying, okay, I only want to look at the Southern Ocean. So we're slicing between the latitudes or wide of 70 to minus 20. And we say, we don't want to look at it monthly. Let's just convert everything into annual means. 
And so when you, you know, when you run any single one of these things, it only takes a sec, whoops, okay. <laughs> um, this is because I already ran all this and it's now confused about where I'm entering back in. Skipping over that. When you run any one of these cells, typically if you've done it in the right order, um, it will happen instantaneously. And so that's basically building the, the DAS graph, telling it these are all the computations that will need to be done, but it doesn't actually run any of those. And so you can run through this quite quickly. And as long as you're only examining the shape of your array and you know the coordinates in there in this sort of metadata sense, uh, it happens more or less instantaneously, no matter how many models you're actually looking at, because you haven't asked for it to recall any data. Up. And so then we can do things like mask the ocean, uh, create, you know, create a mask where we just have, the, this is the land, this is the ocean. And then finally, the actual, you know, the work, the science. Um, in this example, I'm trying to convert everything from depth space into density space, which is, you know, computationally very intensive. You have to uh, define a whole bunch of bins, go through every single cell of the ocean um, for every single variable that you're looking for every single time step and calculate the density uh, and then work out which bin it's sitting in. So you're basically restructuring the entire array. This is computationally a huge pain in the ass normally. Um, but it's something that is, and then sort of re rearranging it and recalculating all the things you're interested in. Um, but when you do it here, it it's actually happens remarkably fast. And then the final step here is to say, okay, well now I've put everything in density space. I want to compare the end of the century, so you know, 2100 temperature versus um, present day, so 2010, uh, sorry, 2015. And so that's effectively what this line is doing, taking the end of the century, the last 10 years, and the start of the century, and just differencing them. And up until this point, nothing has actually been computed. Um, and then I can say, okay, here's the compute step. And I just say, this variable, so the variable we just computed, load. And at that point, the, um, the task will go away and you can actually look at this live, which is very gratifying. Um, it basically, your, um, your, um, so your DAS status basically shows you all your different workers. This is you know, currently finished, but every single line here is a, uh, a different machine. It shows you how much memory each machine is being used. And it's, these colors are basically telling you what task every single cell is doing, uh, every single uh, machine is doing. And you can effectively watch your parallelized work happen in real time, which when it's all working smoothly is really just you know, pretty lights and colors. But when you're trying to troubleshoot things, it can be very useful for working out where a particular process is falling down. And so you know, when I ran this before, it took three minutes to calculate. Um, I'd say it has to work with something like 25 gigabyte of data directly, uh, plus some very computational intensive work. So it's, you know, it's very fast and a lot faster than working with it in a more traditional sense. And then you can just plot it up and that's what's happening here. This is plotting the difference in time between the, you know, the start and the end of the century of temperature of the Southern Ocean averaged you know, across the whole ocean uh, in density space. So this is, you know, there's a lot of computations that go into producing this and Xaray and Pangeo make it, I wouldn't say a breeze, but it makes it really much um, easier to work in a more familiar traditional way um, in a data exploration way with very, very large data sets. And I think I probably should bring it to an end there. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't give a very accurate live demo. This is you know, all prepared earlier, but take it from me, it's, it's, you know, it's a very nice way of working with this.